Okay, good morning everybody. So we, um, oh, did you start yet, David? Yeah, we did. Okay, good. So we uh, just quickly open up in prayer. Maybe just give. So, so, okay. We pray. Father, we thank you that you've prepared the soil of our hearts. Um, we pray that your word might go forth clearly and sharply this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. So, um, firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to actually re-bring this message. I think, um, you know, I did this at uh, last Friday at the, at the men's breakfast in town, and I believe it to be be both a challenging message and one that is very necessary to hear. So, thanks, Marius. <laughs> I know I think you were you were set to talk this morning. But thank you very much for that. Um, for those of you who have heard it already, and there's all the naughty ones down here in front of me. Um, every teacher worth his salt knows that repetition is good. <laughs> so use this as an opportunity to, to bed it in your heart. Okay, so um, towards the beginning of last year, I brought a message from Romans 8, verse 5 to 8. I entitled that message, God's Divine Revelation of the Human Condition. You see, every person comes into this world dead in his trespasses and sins and walks according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, that same spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. So coming into this world, we have condemnation heaped on condemnation. Our, God, our condemnation before God is twofold. Our first level of condemnation is the fact that we have been brought forth from the corrupt line of Adam. Um, this has obviously affected every area the, to the very core of our beings. Um, every part of us has been corrupted. Our minds, our wills, our hearts. And our hearts are, is that area of our deepest affections and desires. Romans 8 verse 7 tells us that as a result of this corruption, we are not even able to subject ourselves to the law of God. So that's the first level of condemnation. The second level of condemnation that is heat on that comes up from the fact that we sin against a holy God every single day. We break his perfect law consciously and unconsciously every single day. So we stand doubly condemned before him. This truth is absolutely important to understand when you are presenting the gospel to an unregenerate sinner. Some people believe that there is some small spark of goodness in a person, some little ember, okay, and all you have to do is fan it into flame. But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that man is spiritually dead and he suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. Meaning that he suppresses the truth in the sin that he loves to do so much. And then on top of that, he deceives himself into thinking that he's good. That's why we need a divine revelation of the human condition. The title of that message. Then later in the year, I um, took you through the first five verses of John. And that's where Nicodemus come to, comes to Jesus by night. Now, now this can be considered part two of that series if you want to. In that passage, Jesus effectively ignores the words coming out of Nicodemus' mouth and answers the real question that is on his heart. The heart, you know, that place of our deepest affections and desires. And what was that question? It was, what must I do to be saved? You see, Nicodemus was at the pinnacle 
of religion. He was the teacher of Israel. And he knew in his heart that he wasn't saved. So the question on his heart is, what must I do to be saved? Jesus then, in no uncertain terms, explains to him that there is nothing that he can do. God is sovereign in salvation. And he is the one who decides to whom he wants to grant the gift of salvation. You see, when Jesus says, you must be born again, he's not giving a command. But he's making a statement of fact. He's not saying, go away and be born again. Instead, what he's saying is, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The Greek word for again is anothen, which literally means from above or from a higher place. So what's he saying? Unless you are born from above, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. I close that message with the fact that no man can save himself. And he can do, uh, all he can do is what every sinner saved by the sovereign grace of God has done in the past. To call on the mercy of God that he may grant you true repentance. Okay, so what I suggest is go and get that recording. The recording it is available because I go into a lot more depth there. Um, but I think it's worth listening to. Right, so this morning's message. I actually want to build on that message, so you can regard this as part three. Um, and this is entitled, Am I Saved? Or a different title would be, The Necessary Evidences of Salvation. You see, when God grants true repentance to a person, that person is brought from spiritual death into spiritual life. God infuses his divine life into that person. And as Ezekiel 36, verse 26, literally, tells us, he removes the heart of stone from him and he gives him a heart of flesh. He gives him a new heart. So as 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says it, and you can say it with me because you know this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So, God makes him a new creature. And he places his spirit within him. Now, along with this new creation, comes a change in behavior. And this is born out of the fact that the person has been changed. But not by his own efforts, not by the efforts of man. He's been changed by the power of God. Okay. Matthew 7 tells us that a good tree can't produce bad fruit. And that a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So out of the new heart come signs or indications or a better word evidences of the fact that the new birth has taken place. These evidences have to be there. They are necessary evidences. They are the fruit of the work that God has performed in the person's heart. What we're going to do now is go through some of these evidences as they presented in the book of 1 John. I probably should have told you guys to read 1 John before. Um, but what we can do with that is we can actually measure ourselves according to them. For the sake of time, we'll only do eight of them, but there are more. Um, and let me just be clear on something. This is not a 50% pass or a 75%, you know, and you'll get distinction. This is actually 100%. They all apply. I found the best way to go through these is in the form of questions that you can pose to yourself. There is one more thing before I start that I have to be very clear on. Matthew 7 also tells us that many people are deceived into thinking that they are saved, but they are actually not. It says that they will, in that day, which day is that? That is the day of judgment, where every man has to stand before God individually. In that day, 
they will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And your, in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And he will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So what kind of person calls Jesus Lord? A professing Christian. So realize that Jesus in this passage, in Matthew 7, was not speaking to pagans or to atheists. He was speaking to those in the church who claim to be Christians but are not. So, examine yourself this morning. Take this as an opportunity. Okay, so we're going to start with test number one. We're going to go relatively quickly through them. So, pay attention. <laughs> so, test number one. And like I said, I'm going to do it in the form of questions. So you ask yourself this question. Question number one. Am I enjoying fellowship with God and Christ? And I'm going to read from 1 John 1 verse 3. What we have seen and what we have heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, what I want you to notice about what John's writing there, he's, he says our fellowship is with the Father, not was. So he's not referring to when Jesus was on the earth. He's talking about a constant communion with God. Someone who acknowledges him in all his ways. Someone who seeks to bring glory to God in everything he does. Whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, you do all to the glory of God. This is what characterizes a believer. Things like prayer, and letting the word of Christ dwell richly within you, and being filled with the Spirit. These are what characterize a constant communion with God. Okay, so that was test one. We move on to test two. Question, am I sensitive to sin in my life? I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 1, from verse 8 to 10. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So one of the great evidences of being a true Christian is not that you don't sin anymore. We all sin. The great evidence is that you now recognize your sin, and you recognize it as sin. I don't like to use the same illustration twice. I've used this in, uh, in Cape Town. But Paul Washer says something that he, it, it just bears repeating because he says it so well. He says it's like marriage. Once you're married, you have a new relationship with that woman that you married. But you also have a new relationship with every other woman on the planet. We, as Christians, have a new relationship to sin. So in these verses um, that I've just read, we've got two sides of the same coin, okay? If we claim to be Christians, this is one side of the coin, if we claim to be Christians, but we walk in darkness, we lie. Our claim doesn't hold any water. On the other side of the coin, if we say that we have not sinned, we make God a liar. We defame his character. We call him a liar. Instead of him on the throne of judgment, we sit in judgment over him. It is characteristic of an unbeliever to be oblivious to the sin in his life. So, are we sensitive to the truth regarding sin in our lives? Okay, so we're going to move on to test number three. Am I obedient to God. And I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 6. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. 
The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has, been, has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. You see, no one perfectly obeys, but it is a direction, not a perfection. Jesus was the only one who walked in complete obedience to the Father. But with us, there is a gracious obedience that the believer walks in. You seek to obey him in everything. It's not only the acts of obedience, it's the spirit of obedience that we're talking about. It is a pattern or a characteristic of the believer. I have a friend, uh, Marcel, and I mentioned this last time as well. He has this very nice saying. He says, when you're as a kid playing in the backyard, it's not about how close you can get to the backyard fence. It's how far away from it you can stay. Okay, I think that is... Test three, am I obedient to God? Test number four, and this, guys, for me, uh, for me personally, is one of the critical ones. Um, do you love other Christians? And I'm going to read from 1 John 2, verse 9 to 11. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You see, if you claim to be in Christ, your life will show some of the patterns of Christ's life. One of these is to love the brethren. John 13 verse 35 says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. The love that we're talking about here is not an emotional kind of love, <coughs> but a serving and a caring kind of love, a decisive kind of love. You decide to love someone. It is also laying down our lives. First John 3 verse 16 says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is one of the necessary evidences of having passed from death to life. First John 3 14, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Let me ask you a question. Do you go to church just so that you can tick that box and say, okay, that's done? Or is it because you want to worship God in the congregation of those who are in communion with him? Do you hang out with fellow Christians and get together with them and discuss the things of God? And then does your heart burn when the scriptures are unfolded in the company of believers? Do you have a desire to fellowship with your eternal family? Or do you just want to get back to your Netflix series? Just saying, nothing wrong with Netflix, okay? Um, you need to get real with yourself here this morning. Examine yourself. So that's, do you love other Christians? Okay, so we move on to test number five. Do you reject the world? And I'm going to read from 1 John 2, verse 15 to 17. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
the world is passing away and also its lusts. But the, the one who does the will of God lives forever. You see, I can ask you the question, who do you want to be like? Who's your role model? But the fact is that I don't need to ask you that question. Because if I spend any amount of time with you, it'll be plain to see. Not because I'm some wise sage or something like that, but because it's written all over you and it'll come out in your behavior. If you want to be like the world, it'll be clear in your behavior. If you want to be like Christ, it'll be clear in your behavior. So there are two important points to raise here. The first one is that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, those things are not from God. They can't coexist in the true believer's heart. The second thing, second thing, is that you can't reject these things naturally. It's not possible. The natural man can't do that. He'll fail. The natural man is incapable of, of overcoming the pull of the flesh. It's only through the power of the indwelling Spirit of God and through the grace poured so abundantly on us that this is possible. So if you think you're going to be able to make it into heaven based on your religious acts or you know, the good things that you do in the community, you're mistaken. So, do you love the world? If you go and read James 4, verse 4, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself the enemy of God. Okay, so we're going to move on to test number 6. Do you eagerly long for the return of Christ? And I'm reading from 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as he is pure. You see, the true Christian has a hope in his heart which, which brings him joy. He longs for that day when he will be finally delivered from this body of death, or the body of this death, as Paul calls it, and, he, and be joined to the Lord in glory. Do you long to be united with him in glory? Do you, as the bride of Christ, with the Spirit of God, say, come. It's funny you preached on this. Or are you willing to let him tarry just for a little while because you've still got some stuff, you know, on your bucket list? And there's still some experiences that this world has to offer that you need to get to. So do you eagerly long for the return of Christ? Okay, let's move on to test number seven. Second last one, um, and in my view this is absolutely critical, do you have the correct Christology? Do you have the correct doctrine of Christ? Remember, we are not saved by our works. We are saved through faith. What we believe about Christ is important. And I'll read from 1 John chapter 2, verse 23. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. You see, some people think that um, the word confess is simply referring to saying some words. The fact is that the demons said things that were true about Christ. And he silenced them. To confess, which is the Greek homologeo, is to say the same thing as. This is not just, you know, it, it, it's not just saying some words to repeat after me. 
The real question is, does your life pattern reflect the same things as what you are confessing about Christ? 1 John 5 verse 1 says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. A true Christian will acknowledge the reality of who Christ is and his full and complete work on the cross. As Andrew likes to say, and I'm paraphrasing, if you remove Christ, if you remove from Christ, you get less out. But if you add to Christ, you also get less out. Just listen to me very carefully. Whenever somebody has a false Christology, a false doctrine of Christ, it is a sign of an unregenerate heart. Why? Because you have the Spirit, and the Spirit leads you into all truth. That's why we always test the Spirit. Because there's so many false teachers out there. 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he said, See to it that you are not deceived. Now this actually implies two different things. The first one, as a Christian, you can be deceived. <clears throat> Why would Christ warn you against something if it were not possible? The second thing is, you are able to prevent yourself from being deceived. Why would Jesus command this if it were not possible to carry out the command? But how do we do this? How do we see to it that we are not deceived? Colossians 3 verse 16 says, by letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is not just reading the scriptures. This is letting it dwell in you richly. You live by it. Right, that's test number seven. Um, test number eight, final one for this morning. Is there a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? First John 3, verse 6 to 9. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has been seen or has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You see, a true Christian cannot have a life pattern. Remember, we're not talking about perfection. We've, meant that, we've mentioned that earlier. But a true Christian can't have a life pattern of sin because it is incompatible with the Holy Spirit. God's seed abides in him. Instead, the life pattern of a true believer is the pursuit of holiness. This is not a legalistic pursuit, but one that is born out of gratitude and is accomplished through the grace that is bestowed on one's life so abundantly from God. It comes out of a deep love for God. Right, in closing, so nobody's perfect. We all in different places in our walks. But these are tests that are given by God so that we can examine ourselves. Like as Paul exhausts us in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Test yourself. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. There are two types of people sitting here this morning. The one kind of person is sitting here saying to themselves, you know, I'm, out of those eight tests, I'm good with six or seven of them. Um, but there's that one area that I'm not so sure about. Does this mean that I'm not saved? No, not necessarily. Ask yourself, 
what is my attitude towards that one area that seems lacking? Is it, ah, oh, whatever, you know, we'll, we'll get to it sometime. Or are you pursuing holiness in God's grace? The other kind of person that's sitting here this morning is saying to themselves, I hear all of this camera, um, but it's not really in my life. I don't see these things as a pattern in my life. I thought I was a Christian, but these necessary evidences that you're talking about are missing. It's, it is you that Christ, to whom Christ is stating the fact you must be born again. You must be born from above. He's calling you to turn from your sin, to repent, to deny yourself, to take up your cross, and to follow him to come not on your terms but on his and then his promise stands John 6 verse 37 whoever comes to me I will in no wise cast out and that is my message so Amen. if you'll allow me to just close in prayer thank you Father, we ask that you would establish your word in our hearts. We ask that you would reveal the true condition of our hearts as we examine ourselves. We ask that you would give us that gift of repentance. And we ask that you would build your church as you have promised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.